I want to provide an overview about U.S. consumer privacy law. And before we get into each specific law, I think it's really important to understand some general themes about the law, the big picture. Basically, to sum things up, U.S. privacy law is a bit of a mess. It's all over the place, with many different types of laws doing many different kinds of things from many different sources and types of law. But overall, I think there are some themes that I want to pull out of the law so we can get some kind of coherent big picture of what's going on here. U.S. privacy law is a bit unique in the world. It's a bit of an outlier, and that's because it uses what's known as the sectoral approach. In contrast, the European Union and most of the rest of the world addresses privacy through what is known as the omnibus approach. They have one baseline privacy law with a set of definitions and standards that provide the minimum level of protection for all types of personal information. In contrast, the United States has a sectoral approach. It has different laws for different sectors. So instead of one federal privacy law, there are dozens upon dozens of federal privacy laws. And then there are state privacy laws as well, and then other types of regulation. And they all do different things. They all define personal data differently. They use different terms. They apply different rules. And this is very complicated. But that is how the U.S. approach works. It's not just one approach, but it's many different approaches all jammed together. Now, one challenge with this approach and one difficulty with the approach is that while it creates a set of unique rules for each sector, the sectors change. They evolve. A lot of these laws were passed in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but since then, things have changed. What used to be the sectors are now different. Companies that were engaged in business in one sector are now doing other things. The problem is that these laws are rarely updated, and so they're built around how the world worked 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But that's not how the world works today. Now the result, too, is that many companies are regulated not just by one law for their sector, they're regulated by many laws for different sectors. And they have to comply with these laws that often conflict and are not quite matching up with each other, and they're subject to many different regulators. Welcome to the sectoral approach in the United States. A key development in privacy worldwide is the rise of the privacy professional. In the United States, they're called chief privacy officers. HIPAA calls them privacy officials. And in the EU, they're called data protection officers or DPOs. So they're either a CPO or a DPO. Sorry, they're not Star Wars droids. Privacy officers perform a very important function. They manage privacy within organizations. You can have all the laws in the world and they can say, do this, 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 and this but companies are not going to comply with them unless they have internal mechanisms to do so. How does a workforce follow rules if they're not trained in what those rules are? How do you ensure an organization follows rules if there's no policies and procedures to implement those rules? You need a governance structure inside an organization to make sure that the law actually gets followed. And that is the important role of the privacy officer. This profession has grown dramatically over the years. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, there were just a handful of privacy officers. But with each year, it grew and grew and grew. And now there are hundreds of thousands of them. And this is still a dramatically growing profession. In addition to privacy officers inside a company, there are also outside counsel and consultants that help them understand the law and comply. Almost all the large law firms now have a privacy practice, and many of these privacy practices are quite big, and they're growing every year. What this means is this is great news for lawyers. There are a lot of jobs in privacy. A lot of work needs to be done. There are many different types of privacy law that regulate consumer information. Examples of the types of law include tort law, contract law, the FTC Section 5, which we'll talk about soon, federal statutes, state statutes, and state common law. And these are just a few. There's still a lot more. What we see is a lot of different types of law, not just one particular type of law. 
Most privacy laws are based on the Fair Information Practice Principles, or the FIPS for short. The FIPS came out originally from a 1973 report by a government agency, and it recommended some principles that should be applied to protect data. These principles have evolved, and they've been embodied in various privacy laws around the world. And we see them not just in U.S. privacy laws, but in privacy laws worldwide. The prominent approach to privacy in the United States is what is known as notice and choice. And it basically works like this. Companies provide a notice about their privacy practices. They say what they do. And then people are given some form of a choice. They can either opt into it or opt out of it or just not do business with the company. This is the predominant approach of how most laws work. And most often, the choice is an opt-out, which I'll talk about a little later, what that means. Basically, this approach relies on the individual being able to read and become informed by the notice and then make a thoughtful decision about whether they are okay with that. But there are problems with this approach. One problem is that hardly anyone reads the privacy notices. And even if they were to read them, they're very hard to understand. These documents are written by lawyers and they're written to be vague and confusing because they don't want to pin the company down. The other problem is the choices aren't very good. Often people aren't given many great choices. Sometimes it's a all or nothing choice, take it or leave it. Often the choice is an opt out but a lot of people don't even bother to read the policy, so they don't even opt out because they don't know about the opt out. We're gonna discuss this approach because it's the approach relied upon by a lot of privacy laws. If you recall when we discussed the GLBA, the Graham Leach Bliley Act, that law relies primarily on the notice and choice approach, provide privacy notices, and then give people a right to opt out of sharing with third parties. Most privacy laws have some component of consent in them. So a person needs to consent to certain things. And the question for the law is, what is the consent going to look like? What constitutes consent? And the laws differ a lot on this. One issue is the extent of coercion. How coerced can the consent be? Can people be forced to consent? Can you give people an all or nothing choice where you either have to accept the use of this data to use the product or not? Or should laws restrict that and say, hey, you can't treat people who choose to exercise their privacy rights as lesser. You can't charge them much higher prices. You can't discriminate against them for protecting their privacy. A lot of laws do that. They will actually try to stop treating people differently for exercising their privacy rights. But not all laws do this. Some laws just say fine. And as a result, you can have highly coerced consent. Another big difference in consent is the distinction between action and inaction. Some forms of consent require an action on the part of the person. The person has to affirmatively indicate they consent. But a lot of US laws rely on inaction. Basically, that means that if the consumer doesn't do anything, they're implied to have consented. Now, I think this is a big leap to say that someone consents when they don't do anything. There's a lot of reasons why people don't do something, but it doesn't mean that they consent to it. It just means they haven't acted because most of the time people don't do things. That's the normal state of things. However, a lot of the laws say that's good enough for consent. And then another dimension of consent is the degree to which people are informed. How informed must a person be to make a choice? The law typically says, well, if you put stuff in a notice and you have some kind of notice, that's good enough. But what's the quality of the notice? Is the notice really clear? Do people really understand it? Is it fully complete? And do people really understand the risks of how their data is going to be used? All these are issues. How informed are people? And should we accept consent if people are not fully informed? Another theme we're gonna see with privacy law as it deals with consumer information is that a lot of these laws are old laws and we're dealing with new situations. And so we'll see a number of old laws not designed to deal with consumer data and the problems of today. They're being applied to these problems laws that were created long before that, and we're gonna see they don't quite fit. 
And then the question is, what do, what, what do you do about that? Do we adjust the laws? Do we kind of try to tweak them? Do we creatively interpret them to fit? Or do we just say they're not a good fit and we should dream up a law that really is designed for this particular problem? How should we deal with this issue? And we're gonna see courts grapple with this a lot. Another issue that we see is privacy by design. This is a term used to describe how technology is designed in ways that implicate privacy. And so if you really want to be effective in regulating privacy, you need to think about design because the way that software works and the way that various services and products work, it, the privacy implications are built into the very structure, the very architecture of it. So if you don't do anything to affect that architecture, you have dramatic impacts on privacy. And there's often very little the law can do at that late stage. So some laws are trying to get involved in regulating design. But this raises a big issue. Should the law meddle with design? Some commentators say no, the law shouldn't get involved in design because who are policymakers to start telling technologists how to build their technologies? Policymakers don't know a lot about technology. They shouldn't be working on how technologies are built and, and structured. On the other hand, if the law doesn't do anything here, you get problems. A number of companies will often say, we're practicing privacy by design. We bake privacy into our products. We care about privacy and we're baking it in. But one thing to ask when you hear this is, what are they baking in exactly? Because privacy by design depends upon a conception of privacy. I spoke about this earlier in this class and I've said it again and again, that every law, every case, depends upon a conception of privacy. The privacy that you think about, the way it's conceived, matters for how a product is designed for it. You can't bake something in if you don't know the recipe. So a lot of times what companies will do when they say privacy is they'll have a very narrow understanding of privacy. Well, we encrypt the data, so we've protected privacy. Oh, we provided some access control, so we provided privacy. What they don't realize is privacy involves many different things. It's very complicated, as we've seen. And so when they talk about baking privacy in, they need to bake all of privacy and not just a few things. So we really need to think about what does it mean to design something for privacy? And we have to make sure that a robust conception of privacy is used when designing products and services for that. And that's one role of the law. To what extent should the law say that if you're designing for privacy, this is what you should do. This is the recipe you should follow. Or at least you need to have a certain recipe that's more robust than a very simplistic, narrow understanding of privacy. We're going to talk about these themes and more as we dive into the various types of privacy law that regulate in this area.